So you've got yourself a Volkswagen Audi Group 2 litre TDI engine and you're looking for a bit more power. Well thankfully that's very easy to do. There's an easy way of gaining 20 to 30% more power and in some cases with the right mods you can even potentially double the power that your engine currently has. So we're going to look at mods for this engine. There's basically now been three major revisions of this engine over the years. So this is going to be a complete guide to all three of those engines. So stay tuned to find out what you can do to your Volkswagen Audi 2 litre. A TDI. So let's have a look at tuning the 2 litre TDI engine from the Volkswagen Audi Group. It's one of the most popular engines around when it comes to diesel engines among modifiers. There's a lot of things that you can do to it, but there's also some areas that you need to be aware of so that you don't make the same mistakes that we see people doing over and over again when it comes to upgrades and mods for this engine. So there's been a few revisions of the 2 litre TDI over the years, and it's fair to say that each time Volkswagen have come out with a better version of the engine. Now there's always teething trouble with a new generation of engines so it's worth working out what they are and I would always personally avoid buying the first few years of a new generation of engine and just give them time to iron out all of the kinks. The 2 litre TDI generally divides into just two engines the 140 horsepower version and the 170 horsepower version with slight power variations either side of that. The main difference between these two engines is the turbo and most of the 170s also came with a DPF and used the Siemens ECU and Siemens injectors. So when it comes to upgrading these, you can take the 140 to 170 quite easily, but pushing it beyond that, you really need to address the turbo and swapping in a turbo from the 170 makes an awful lot of sense. It gives you a bit more headroom to work in. So first up, we've got the EA188. Now that was a PD engine. It came in a lot of different flavors, a lot of different power levels and was used extensively throughout the Volkswagen Audi group. It was a good solid engine thanks to its mechanical simplicity which made it a dream to work on but it wasn't very well suited for the ever increasing emission standards so a revision needed to be made. So after that in about 2008 we had the EA189 version of the engine. This was the generation of engines that were implicated in the diesel scandal where the emissions were tweaked artificially to give super low readings. It was a good engine, they converted it from the PD to the CR setup when it comes to fueling and you've got a lot more control over the fueling. So mappers love these engines because you've got much more precise control over the fueling and you can really tweak it and get every little scrap of power. So what's the difference between common rail and pumper Dusa or PD engines? Well PD engines create their fuel pressure using camshaft driven pumps one per cylinder. That does put a huge strain on the camshaft mechanism and it's not very controllable. You can only set the amount of fuel going into all four cylinders at the same rate. Whereas CR is far superior because this allows the ECU much finer control of the fuel timing because the injectors can be individually controlled for duration and timing. So essentially you've got phase control on each injector. It was done primarily to help emissions but it gives the tuner an awful lot more to play with whilst tuning it and that's got to be good for us. Just having two engines that are identical, one with PD and one with the CR fuel system, you will get more power out of the CR fuel system. It'll be more flexible and you'll, you'll really benefit by having that mapped and set up correctly. If you want a bit more power than that, a remap is not enough. You need some other components to be upgraded within the engine. So often you'll find that the fueling starts to become a problem. So when you've started to increase the power significantly, you're burning more fuel and you've got to make sure that the engine gets enough fuel to match the amount of air that's coming into it. So look at upgrading the fuel pump and the injectors. Often they can be swapped out from the higher performance variants within the Volkswagen Group families. From 2010, the EA189 engines had an upgrade to the fuel system and they used eight nozzle injectors, which gave much better atomization of the fuel as it went into the cylinders and really helped the economy and the power. Now they're up against these emission standards that are getting ever, ever tighter. So this was a, a very necessary move, but it didn't actually sacrifice on the performance of the car so it's nice to see that the Volkswagen Audi group have managed to get more power and more performance out of the engine but actually still meet those emissions regulations. They also at this time fitted a water-cooled exhaust gas recirculation system 
and they recited and they redesigned the DPF setup on the engines, making it a bit more efficient. It was a big problem with the early engines, as you'll see in our problems video, with the DPF filters getting clogged up, particularly if you only did short journeys. So this revision of the engine went some way to address that, although there were still some problems with regard to the DPF filters stacking up and getting clogged up and needing a lot more work, replacement, repair um, and expense. So these engines pre about 2010 if you've got the the 110 or the 120 horsepower version you need to get those injectors upgraded the fuel system on those was a basic fuel system they weren't aiming at massive power it was basically built for economy so although the engines are predominantly the same as the higher powered versions the fuel system was definitely lacking so in order to get any sort of mapping and headroom to work in you need to get that fuel system upgraded with the injectors from the higher powered versions at the very least really. So from 2015 we see another major revision to the 2 litre TDI engine. This is the EA288 revision and it was more than just an update. They've completely reworked the engine and addressed most of those early problems and issues that cropped up. There's predominantly two types of the engine. There was a lower powered 140 brake horsepower. Some were slightly under, some were a little bit over that. Then there was 160 70 horsepower engine. There was also an interesting bi-turbo setup that raised the power level even higher. The 110 and 150 horsepower versions have smaller turbos than the higher powered 170 horsepower versions. So look at the engine as a whole when it comes to upgrading and don't just do simple little tasks and then come back to it months later. Have a plan up front. So we would recommend on these engines that a remap, if that's the only mod you do, is the most significant power gain that you can have for your money. A simple remap can add 20 to 30 percent and it won't affect the economy of the engine in any way, shape or form. And most people actually get better economy after the car has been remapped. It does depend a little bit on the mapper and how you actually use the car. But generally speaking, these engines give an awful lot more fuel economy and power if you get them remapped. So why should you remap them? Well, the, the manufacturers have to work in a variety of different markets with different fuels, different climates. And rather than optimize each engine specifically for the market it's being sold in, they will come up with a very generic setting that works well across all the markets, which is fine. It's a good cost saving exercise. But when it comes to extracting the maximum performance from your engine, it does leave quite a bit of headroom that we can work in and extract that little bit more power from from the engine. So that makes remaps the number one mod that you can do on these engines. Now, after a remap, you need to start thinking about the turbos. So you need to dump more air into the engine in order to burn more diesel. And just by getting a bigger turbo will give you a lot more headroom when it comes to increasing the power of your two litre TDI engine. So there's lots of options out there. So we're gonna have a look at those in a little bit. But generally, most people with the 140 will swap in a 170 turbo because they're readily available from breakers yards. And that gives you a fairly instant power hike and if you get it mapped correctly and set up correctly you can take it to really decent power levels so if you start off with a 170 brake horsepower engine a remap can take that easily to 200 225 brake horsepower so that's quite a decent hike but but if you want to take it further than that you really need to look at upgrading the turbo so up to around 2003 Volkswagen Audi group used the Borg Warner turbo a BV40 VNT which is a really good solid turbo but there's upgrades around for it so two options we see our members and visitors to our site fitting quite a lot both Garrett turbos there's the GTB 2056 VK which is a really good turbo it's not laggy it gives you a decent low-end boost of power and takes you up to the headline power figures that you actually want from a remap and then if you wanted more power there's the GTB 2260 VK which would see power levels reaching about 260 270 brake horsepower obviously depending on the map the fueling and all the other mods but that gives you a bit more headroom but there is a little bit more lag at the low end so the former turbo we recommend there is probably better suited for everyday road use so there's quite a few turbo upgrades for the EA288 turbo we'll just pop some of the suggestions on the screen of turbos that have worked quite well on this you've got the G2060 
CTD2872 VRK, which is generally good for about 340 to 400 brake horsepower. You've got the GTB2260 VK, which peaks at around 300 horsepower. The slightly smaller GTB1756 BK at 220, which has got a really nice low end spool up. So that's probably the one that's best suited for everyday driving. Then you've got the VNT1722 hybrid turbo, which is good for about 210 horsepower, and the GT1749 VB, which is another 200 horsepower turbo with a very favorable spool up profile. So when you get a turbo, think very carefully about the spool up profile and where that power band is that you actually want it to be working in. You need to watch out as well that the engines are the correct orientation. So the Sats and the A4s and the larger cars, generally speaking, had longitudinal mounted engines, whereas the smaller cars, the A3s, the Golfs, that sort of thing, had the transversely mounted engines. And there were a few differences in the plumbing that goes into the turbo. So it's easy to get caught out. You've bought a turbo for a two litre TDI engine, but it's the wrong orientation. So you just need to change a few of the ancillary parts on the turbo to make it fit properly in your engine bay and work on your car. The second option you've got when it comes to turbo upgrades is to swap in a hybrid turbo. So a hybrid turbo takes a standard turbo casing from the Volkswagen Audi group and they change out the internal components within that turbo to give more preferential flow rates. The compressor wheel is generally a little larger. It allows you to optimize the power profile to exactly where you want that power to be. So there are a few camshaft adjustments that can be made on most of the 2 litre TDI engines but you're into the realms of really needing to know what you're up to. There's a few performance cams that optimize the intake and the exhaust valves and they should be selected really to match your map and your turbo but they can give you a decent amount of headroom but also on a lot of the TDI engines that I've looked at they've got vernier pulleys which allow you to just alter the orientation of the cam very slightly and what that does effectively is moves your power band up and down the RPM range so it allows you to put that power power exactly where you want it to be. It's a fairly simple adjustment to make, but if you get it wrong, you really do mess up the engine and the smooth running abilities of it. So be very, very careful. Research thoroughly what you're doing. We've got articles on our site that go into more mods for the two litre TDI, and they go into a lot more detail than we can here in a simple video. So the airflow sensor is often a problem area when it comes to upgrading the turbo. The stock sensors are pretty good, but when you're dumping a lot more air in, it's not surprising they can't cope with it. So upgrading to three 3.54 bar airflow sensors can make quite a big difference to the overall stability of your car, its reliability and the power figures you get. It'd be silly for a small component like the airflow sensors to be holding you back and backing off on the power. Do we recommend exhaust upgrades and intake mods on the 2 litre TDI engine? Well they're nice to have as mods if you want to do something to your car and you want something shiny to to look at but in terms of performance they give very little of a return so I'd love to tell you that a sports exhaust on the 2 litre TDI will add substantial amounts of power but it doesn't I'd like to tell you it really changes the exhaust note and makes it nice but the 2 litre TDI engine is quite a clunky agricultural engine and it's really not enhanced in my opinion by adding a sports exhaust if you feel differently please let me know in the comments I love to hear people's feedback perhaps you found an exhaust setup that works particularly well and I've just not discovered it yet. On the intake side, the, the stock air filter and air box flow really well. So it's actually quite hard to improve upon that. Even with a full induction kit, you will only add about two to 3% of power. And that's within the realms of margin of error when you put a car on the dyno. So you really won't see substantial gains by fitting an induction kit. I have fitted a K&N cotton gauze panel air filter to my two litre TDI engine. And I noticed that that did help the engine feel more responsive. And when you lift it off, unusually, the engine just sort of carried on. It didn't bog down as quickly as it would have done with the stock paper OEM filter. So it made a subtle difference, but nothing much. And it's probably not worth doing as a mod in its own right. But if you need to replace the air filter and you're looking for something that's washable, then these aftermarket high performance filters are a good bet. You can reuse them over and over again. And they just drop into the standard air box. And they'll give you similar 
similar gains to what you would get with a full induction kit. If you've dramatically hiked the power, then it's time to start looking at the induction of the engine. But the, the two litre TDI engine doesn't operate in very high RPM bands. So you're never talking about substantial flows of air. It's very good at extracting power from all of the fuel that it gets. So whenever you have a turbo compressing air into an engine, you get a big buildup of heat and the intercooler is basically a radiator that allows the compressed air that's become very hot to be exposed to the flow of air coming into the car from the ambient temperatures around and that drops the temperature back down. Now that makes quite a significant difference to performance. We've run a few figures and um, looked at lots of stats and generally if you look at the screen now, we'll just flash up the significant difference that different engine temperatures make on power. And the basic premise behind this is the fact that colder air carries more oxygen and you need the oxygen to burn the fuel, whatever fuel it is that you're using. So if you can lower your temperature of the intake charge, it'll carry more oxygen, you'll be able to burn more fuel and you'll make more power. Now, don't think of an intercooler as a mod that adds power to your engine. It's just something there to keep the power levels as they were originally designed. And as the intercooler does its job, it actually starts to get warmer. And we call that heat soak, where the heat builds up inside the intercooler itself. So after a lot of spirited driving, the intercooler will get quite hot and it will really degrade its ability to cool that intake charge. It's fair to say that most factory cars come with very limited intercoolers. The capacity within them is barely adequate for your everyday driving. There's normally a very good argument for fitting an uprated intercooler to the factory one. It's normally much larger in size, the aftermarket ones, and they're best mounted at the front, which sometimes requires a little bit of modification to the front bumper just to make it all fit. But they sit down there quite tidily in front of the radiator in most different models. So it's certainly something worth thinking about. And if you don't do lots of spirited drive and you're not heating the intercooler up, you don't really need an aftermarket intercooler. But if you've added a bigger turbo, there's a lot more compression going on. It certainly makes sense to uprate the intercooler. And there's quite a few aftermarket options around that work really, really well. Certainly a lot better than the factory standard ones. And even within model ranges, you'll find that the performance models sometimes come with better intercoolers than the lower performance ones. So there are a few extra things that you can do to the 2 litre TDI engine. You can add tuning boxes, which are plug-in interfaces between the ECU and the sensors on the car, and they act like an aftermarket ECU, or they should do. There's a lot of really cheap tuning boxes out there that are best avoided, and all they will do is dump more fuel into your engine, which sort of makes more power because you've got more fuel going in, but it makes a lot more cert. It'll clog up your DPF filters. It'll wreck your fuel economy and it'll probably be quite smoky so you may well meet emissions problems when it comes to having the car put through its annual roadworthiness test. So research those upgrades very very carefully. Traction is usually an issue on most models unless you've got the four-wheel drive. When you get to about 200 to 20 horsepower you will start to experience traction problems and if you were remapping one, I would strongly recommend you avoid having a big spike in the lower part of the RPM range. Give the turbo a little bit of time to spool up and get the car actually moving before the massive kick of power comes in. So on my 2 litre TDI A3, I had that mapped and the power was starting to seriously come on about 2000 RPM. When it came on earlier, I had a lot of traction issues and it didn't make the car very drivable. It was working constantly against the traction control so just moving that initial spike of power up a little bit made a big difference and it helped increase your, your joy of everyday driving the power was where you wanted for overtaking other cars 
So I hope this video has been useful to you. If you've got that two litre TDI engine, you've got a real gem of an engine. There are a few inherent problems that you need to be aware of as you get with any engine. And I've got another video that covers those problems. If you know about the problems, then you'll avoid them and you probably notice them before they start to become a major issue. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. We've got lots more in-depth videos. So we're taking apart the mods that we've recommended in this summary and looking in depth at what each of those does, why they work so well, and we'll be flagging up the common myths and misunderstandings that people have about various car mods. And we've got lots more coming up on the two litre TDI. It's one of my favorite engines that I've ever owned. So drop us a like, it really helps us to get out there. And let us know in the comments what you've got, what car it's in, what mods you've done, what you found beneficial, because that helps us all to build a better overall picture of tuning and modifying.